Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we are getting into the January 2026 Eurasian winter crisis. Right. And this is not just another coal snap. We're talking about a massive uh, structural failure in the atmosphere. Something sources have started calling the Great Eurasian Atmospheric Separation. Exactly. You had two completely different weather systems at war with each other, high energy storms in the west, and this, this deep continental freeze in the east. And our mission today is to really unpack the mechanics of that. You want to know why it happened, and I think more importantly, what it revealed about our vulnerability. What a surprising one. Yeah. A really surprising one. Okay, so let's start at the top because this whole thing began miles above us, didn't it? A top-down disruption. That's right. The immediate trigger was something called a major sudden stratospheric warming, an SSW, back in late December 2025. A heat pulse way up in the what? stratosphere. A massive one. And it triggered a complete breakdown. And this is the key part, a bifurcation, a splitting of the stratospheric polar vortex. So the container holding all that Arctic air just shattered. It shattered, but you know, the conditions had to be right for it to shatter so catastrophically. So what set the stage for this? It wasn't just random chance, was it? Not at all. The failure was made possible by a couple of pre-existing conditions. First, we had an easterly quasi-biennial oscillation phase. A big shift in tropical winds. Right. And you combine that with a strongly negative Arctic oscillation. And when the AO goes negative like that, it's like all the gates just swing open for Arctic air to pour south. And pour it did. Okay, let's look at the fallout, starting with Western Europe, which got hit by those maritime storms. Yeah, you had Storm Garetti, then Jared. They were brutal. I mean, they pushed UK temperatures down to minus 12.5 degrees Celsius. But that wasn't the real story, was it? Mm. The shocking part was the logistical failure. That's where it gets really interesting. The main crisis point was Amsterdam ship hole. Tell us about that. Because it wasn't the snow or the wind that grounded the planes. No. Over 700 flights were canceled because they ran out of de-icing fluid, a catastrophic region-wide shortage. So the supply chain broke before the weather did. Precisely. It was a systemic failure, not a weather one. A logistical breakdown on one side. Mm -hmm. And on the other, just sheer, brutal cold. An incredible contrast. The eastern half saw this sustained, punishing freeze. Moscow had record snow, then lows of minus 17. And that's nothing compared to the Siberian interior. No, that's where it became truly lethal. We're talking temperatures dropping to minus 54, even minus 60 degrees Celsius in some places. Minus 60? I can't even imagine what happens to a city at that temperature. It fails. The Angarsk power plant went down, leaving 160,000 people with no heat in minus 31 degrees. Oh, wow. And Dudinka had a utility outage that lasted for two weeks. This kind of cold doesn't just stress the system, it dismantles it. And the atmosphere was so chaotic, it was even causing, what was it, mud rains? Yeah, mud rains in Greece. That's from Saharan dust getting pulled all the way north and mixing with rainfall. Just a bizarre side effect. Which brings us to the agricultural impacts, because there was this strange risk versus reward situation playing out. Exactly, a real paradox. The immediate risk was to the winter wheat crop in southwestern Russia. You had this frigid air hitting bare ground with no snow to insulate it. A potential crop disaster. A huge one. But at the same time, that extreme cold in the Far East led to something they called Siberian disinfection. Meaning it killed off pests. It wiped them out. Things like the Siberian silk moth. So you have this this dual threat, a major loss in one area, but a potential boost to the late 2026 harvest in another. The lesson here seems to be that you can't rely on historical averages for anything anymore. Not at all. It forces you to adopt a totally new way of modeling risk. So the January 2026 crisis really proved that our old playbooks for everything from airport logistics to power grids are, well, obsolete. They are. And that leaves you, the listener, with a pretty profound question to think about. We hear from our sources that Arctic amplification is making the jet stream lazy and wobbly. Right. So if the polar vortex is going to keep splitting like this, if these locked in extremes become the new normal, how do you even begin to reimagine global infrastructure for a climate that tries to freeze you and flood you at the very same time?